Okay, no problem. Okay, so it's uh, today where um, that's uh, October 4th, it is 3.31 p.m. UTC. Welcome everyone to session eight, the panel on Big Frame implementation experiences. I am Marie-Claude Côté from Library and Archives Canada, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator for this panel. I'm talking to you today from the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation in Canada. Before I introduce our speakers, let me go over some uh, logistics. Each speaker will present for about 20 minutes, one after the other, and a question period of about 20 minutes will follow at the end of the session. Uh, to this effect, feel free to use the chat function to ask your questions and I will read them up on your behalf. Or you can also raise your virtual hand and uh, your, your uh, microphone will be unmuted so that you can ask your question. All the details concerning our speakers and their presentations are found on the conference website at www.dublincourt.org. Okay, and I forgot to share my, my screen, but at this point, it doesn't matter. So welcome our speakers. In order of presentations, we will have Niklas Lindstrom from National Library of Sweden, Susanna Postmato from Adcult and Casalini Libri, and Sally McCallum from the Library of Congress. And without further ado, please let's welcome Niklas. Nicholas, you have the screen. Thank you. Then I'll start to share and hope everything works. Okay, do you see any slideshow now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Then I just check my time here as well so I see where I'm at. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Niklas Lindström and I am a developer at the National Library of Sweden. Uh, what we have done in Sweden and at the National Library is that we have worked to take the National Union catalog, which is called Libris, uh, from an existing system which was using Mark 21 as a data format and uh, uses that as an exchange format uh, for our different member libraries. And we have many different members, uh, local uh, municipal libraries and uh, research libraries and university libraries, and all of them catalog collaboratively in Libris. So Libris itself is built on uh, principles of openness and cooperation. And we also share our data with other libraries and uh, op have open data as a policy for everything. So uh, for as much as we can, I should say, because we have certain contracts with suppliers as well. But that's our core principle. And uh, we have built a new system which is called Libris Excel that's just an implementation detail the name is not relevant in for users of our data in practice uh, it is the fifth generation of Libris systems Libris is now this year 50 years old so yay for that that is very exciting since we are now uh, using Excel in production, we have done so for four years. And uh, what we are focusing here on are, of course, the implementation experiences from this. Uh, and the new system is baked on linked data and uh, uses BibFrame as a fundament for the descriptions in the new system. We have many ambitions with the systems, both local and global. Uh, the local ambitions are to continue to support and enhance discovery within the catalog so that uh, all the different users, patrons, researchers, catalogers themselves can work more effectively with the data uh, to maintain quality and consistency. At the same time, as we're 
working to make this data much more widely accessible, given that Mark 21 isn't something that developers, web developers or other kind of systems developers are acquainted with. We are working towards something more that can be used more widely on a worldwide scale. And uh, of course, in practice, that means semantic interoperability and uh, understanding and be able to navigate between different domains and use modern technology. So how do we do this then? How did we do it and how do we continue to evolve? Well, first we linked the catalog, uh, which is something that I could talk about in excruciating detail, which I won't, so I will just fly through that part, uh, which basically starts off by looking at all the data that were sort of, I shouldn't say hidden in Mark 21, but uh, hard to understand for people who weren't acquainted with it. Uh, and also, and more crucially, it was sort of denormalized, meaning that there were many strings that were copied throughout the system. Certain strings were managed using the notion of authorities so that the same author name was used throughout the books that an author had written, for example. But this was the way things looked in Mark 21. Uh, so understanding and working with this data, trying to find how what people are trying to express and how they have expressed it and uh, understanding it more as notions that state as statements about entities uh, or triples which we of course think in when we think about rdf which linked data is based on and then which is even more interesting and more important is of course to link these entities together so that's the gist of the movement from Mark 21 and into a library knowledge graph. But the important aspect here is usability. Uh, the technology can provide various means and efficiencies for certain aspects of usability. Editability is one aspect, shareability is another aspect, and reusability is a third aspect. You can slice these things in many forms of qualities, but uh, these are the three points of view that I am focusing on right now when I talk about the usability of linked data. The catalog itself, which is the only actual interface we have right now, is uh, data driven so everything that you do in the system directly uses entities and the terms for the entities so everything you see in the system uh, is actually just one step away from the raw rdf itself so these are the labels for the for the properties that we have uh, the data described by uh, so there is no conversion or or cleaning or something more advanced going on in practice it's very close to the actual raw data and uh, so that's the sort of usability the interface aspect of it not only editability but navigate navigation and searching and then you have the conceptual interoperability which is more about sharing so we need to have standards we need to have shared terminology and leaving Mark 21, what would we use when we did that? Uh, thankfully, Library of Congress also wants this, and they defined the BIB frame for us, which was perfect because uh, we were at the time sort of in between the first iteration of BIB frame, which was BIB frame 1.0, and uh, we looked at schema.org. We had also looked at uh, a mix of vocabularies. Uh, using Dublin Core and the Bibio ontology and extending that. But when BibFrame 2 came along, we formally, formally aligned with that. Uh, I would come into more details later on. So, but uh, that is something sort of pivotal for us to stand on. And 
being able to reuse data requires some kind of normalization because even though you can describe things using other terminologies than uh, are existent in mark 21 and if you have the notion of identity and entity you can use rdf to make something that is potentially more normalized but you can still have duplicates of every description and no shared uris no identities for anything and then you have no real normalization going on so this is something that we are continuously working to improve in the catalog we have persons linked we have subject headings linked we have certain interlinking between, for instance, uh, a print and a digitized version of the print. So a di digital reproduction. Uh, but there are many more things that we need to link in order to make, the, make this less uh, denormalized and more reusable and more cohesive. This is a, a representation of the data exactly as it looks in our system. So th this is even more close to the raw data. You can get this as turtle or JSON-LD or RDF-XML, if you will. It's the same thing in RDF. It means the same thing, and it's the same data model, the abstract RDF syntax. Uh, so this is just a nice sort of turtle with rounded corners. I sometimes call this presentation view. Uh, the only thing here that doesn't really exist right now throughout our system is that we have a shared work in the middle here and we need to link those so that's one project that's going on at the moment that we're working hard to get out in production uh, we are aiming to do that at the end of this year now understanding what we have here is it's fairly easy for us who are working with the system and more so going on using the system for the cat catalogers. Uh, I tend to think of descriptions like RDF descriptions as maps and uh, knowing maps, you know that one map doesn't fit everybody. And sometimes you don't even know that what you're looking at is a map unless you also know something about the territory and the symbols and everything else that that map is represented by. So understanding the symbols on a map is equivalent in this simile to understanding RDF vocabularies. And in the system, we sort of notice uh, an interesting psychological phenomenon, which I hit upon many times over the years and that is that humans in general and everybody regardless of developers or experts in anything we don't really comprehend what we see we see what we comprehend and that's a problem because that means that when you go into something especially something new like a linked library catalog system if you don't know what to expect, it's very hard to comprehend what you see and especially hard to understand what possibilities you have here. So how can we work in some in a new environment and get a shared notion of understanding what we have and what we can do? I mean, if people have never seen linked works and don't understand what we mean by the work notion in BibFrame, it's very hard to work iteratively with lots of people sharing the same understanding and sharing the same expectations. And so how do we do this? On the one hand, how do we maintain the comprehension that we are sort of reaching uh, when we develop the system, especially when we onboard new developers or new user interface designers? How do we share all of this can we formalize it do we use standards do we write thesis theses or what's the process here is there a process here well the only process that i know of is continuous usage uh, talking about it having systems working in practice and uh, meeting needs 
whatever those needs may be. So working with things in practice and then trying to formalize those practices as we go further and standardize those ideally. But we can't really start with a perfect standard and then just things come naturally from that position. We have to evolve that position. And we, one of the core things here is that we need practical semantic interoperability, not just uh, shared notions through experience, but we need to formalize this. We need some kind of shared ontologies, and we know that they don't work for everybody. But trying to understand what people need uh, and uh, sort of see what we have and then go from there iteratively is one process that I think is possible. And there are many ways to say the th same thing. And one way is not necessarily better than the other in any objective way, but it's more recognizable depending on where you come from. So th that is a challenge when you try to design ontologies and we and when you try to achieve semantic interoperability. And what we do, well, this situation again is the map situation. We, we look for symbols that we can standardize on. And those symbols might not be all the symbols that you need, but they will be the shared symbols. And uh, one way of thinking of the descriptions that we have is that they are a kind of subway map. So you won't necessarily understand the city totally from the descriptions, but you will be able to find and navigate through something like the city, like the library knowledge graph. Uh, and this notion is very useful for us. This is sort of how we think about BibFrame. It is also sort of how we think about Dublin Core and SCOS and all these other ontologies that they work together and they are different means for drawing maps. In practice, when it comes to technical interoperability, we need to sort of translate this thinking into tooling. And uh, we have come some way along that path in practice in our system. Uh, for instance, we, we have ambitions again to go beyond just programming when it comes to how data is handled in the system. Uh, we, we really do not want to be contingent upon, especially not a certain serialization format, although at the core we use JSON and JSON-LD. The system and how you interact with the system shouldn't depend on that technical detail. It should, though, depend on the RDF semantics, because that's a sort of substrate of technical interoperability that I believe is sufficient to be able to maintain some kind of shared notion, given that we need vocabularies and we need precision, precision of identity, using URIs as identifiers. Because otherwise we would still have layers of, upon layers of complex programming trying to realize interfaces instead of sh shortening the gap between our system and other systems. So the level of contract is at the RDF technical level. And the RDF stack of specifications is not complete yet because library systems have existed for decades and the uh, native RDF-based systems haven't matured so far yet. There are many mature technologies, but they don't cover necessarily everything yet. And one of the things that is important for us is that we know that one vocabulary won't fit everybody's need. Uh, BibFrame is perfect for us as library data managers at this point in time. Uh, but when we developed the system, we knew that we can't be fundamentally contingent upon just that. So we devised what is at this point in time, mainly just a notion uh, of an application vocabulary, which is uh, not reinventing BibFrame, but just creating an ontology and say that these terms are equivalent property, equivalent class to BibFrame, 
or subproperty and subclass if we have an extended notion or a more precise notion, so a subclass, which means that we have restricted it somehow. Or at times we define a wider notion because we can't be as precise as the term is in the frame, for instance. And then without using our reasoning, uh, we, we are using, and this is at this point in time, an experimental phase. We, we use these OWL and RDF schema mappings to go directly from one format to the other. Because it's basically, you could call it, if you're a programmer, it's like a dictionary lookup. You know that this term is equivalent to that term. Of course, when there are different granularities, we need to be a bit more creative. Uh, and I won't go into the details about how I, I can hint at all property chain axioms and things like that. There are means to declare how something that is expressed as a complex value in BIM frame could be mapped to a simple value in schema.org, the ISBN, for instance. So this is a mechanism that is not too complex because it's not like multiple layers of code. It's just a mapping technique. Uh, and we have used this in practice to import uh, SCOS concept schemes into our system. And that I will come back to that if I have the time. <laughs> and because that the, that's a part of the other hard question here, namely how do we utilize the new possibilities of linked data and when we think in terms of library infrastructure uh, of federation of data of data interchange do we even do data interchange in a native linked data environment is that something that you should you think like that when you're using linked data shouldn't you just link uh, and uh, i believe that the answer is yes. Of course, in practice, yes involves something a bit more complicated. So going on an abstract level using linked data and then thinking about how to align identities and vocabularies, we need to th start thinking about Practicality, practicalities around the techniques when you federate this in practice. So at this point in time, and now I'm back to the importing the concept schemes, we cache data locally, and then using target vocabulary maps as a technique, we map that to the application vocabulary that we have. And that means that we have an identity that is not ours, and we have data that is not ours, but it is mapped to the terms that we use so that we can use it in our system. You can search for it in our indexing services. So you can link to another concept as if it were defined in our system. And this is, to some people, this is obvious because that's how linked data works, but it's not necessarily realized on scale. And it's certainly not precisely defined at this point in time uh, to be able to use some sort of off-the-shelf system and expect all of this to just work. So this is where I think that as a community, both as a library community and in the wider community of semantic web and linked data usage and using different ontologies, there are ways to formalize these practices. And I think that is the most interesting thing about where we're at right now. Both vocabulary interoperability and systems federation using linked data. And then uh, there is the notion of provenance, of course, incorporated in this caching. And how do you then, uh, if you don't want to use something different from another system, but you want to incorporate just one statement, and that goes into details that I cannot elaborate further on here. I can just mention that we are looking at, for instance, RDF star as the new modern technology that might be standardized for using reification in a more efficient way. And we have also looked at how we can represent 
the way we version our data internally using those notions of triple level provenance. And with that, this is just an ending slide to sort of reiterate what I've been talking about and what technologies that are on my mind right now regarding where we're at and what we need to formalize more as a community. That's well, all. thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Uh, I really like your map analogy. It made things uh, really clearer for me <laughs> and the many graphics to I'm a visual type of person. So that was perfect. You uh, succeeded to make something fairly complex, easy to understand. Thank you. So thank you again. And now we will welcome our second speaker, Tiziana Pasmato. Tiziana, the screen is yours now. Thank you. Do you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. So good morning, good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank for the, the opportunity to briefly present the shared initiative with, with reference to some developments and experiences to put BibFrame in practice. Uh, I'm Tiziana Possemato, Director of ATCALT and the Chief Information Officer of Casalini Libri, and I'm here representing the Share Family Initiative. Throughout Share uh, BD infrastructure development, uh, the partner libraries have been actively engaged in Share BD working groups that support define and test the components of shared BD, including refining data model and entity identification clustering processes, use case development for the cluster knowledge base editor, jQuicket, that support the management of entities and the discovery portal, so to how to present information. Their involvement in these working groups has ensured that each library's use case and requirements are accounted for the development process and that Shell BD continue to support this transition towards link and data implementation. But I would like to use this meeting opportunity to focus on three crucial elements of the entire data management process in a shared project. The first one I would like to start from is the one related to entity resolution and clusterization tool. Uh, which starting from MAC records uh, and from external sources available for machine processes uh, manages to identify each entity otherwise hidden in the bibliographic and authority records. In this process, a large amount of data arrive from participa participating libraries and are subjected to ma matching algorithms for the identification of entity contained therein. In this process, the reference data model to give shape to the entities is that of shared BD developed by the CEI working group by, based on BibFrame, of course, and the contribution of external sources is precious to achieve a certain degree of certainty with respect to the identification of the entity. The process of modeling an entity must not forget the needs that many libraries have to retro-commercial of data from the entity to the mark records, often functional to the various operational processes of the library. The same entity is usually represented in different ways within the same database in the case of pseudonyms, for example, or even more evidently in different databases for many different reasons, starting with the habit of looking at the things for, from a certain perspective, or even just for the application of different cataloging rules. The entity we describe in the various information system is always much more complex than the way we represent it. And information, information technologies, uh, technology gives up the, the ambition of an exhaustive representation. Therefore, we can imagine how complex the entity identification mechanism is. 
Realizing entity resolution algorithms, starting from structured data such as those of libraries, however, facilitates the process. Therefore, the starting point for entity resolution process is made up of a set of information that expresses the identity of a particular real world entity. This information unit within the entity resolution is often defined as a profile. And the characteristic of these phases of the process of, of identification and reification of data is that the more numerous these profiles are, the greater are the possibility of creating information chains that lead to the identification of an entity. The more numerous and the qualitatively relevant the profiles to match, the higher the chance of a current identification. The entity resolution clustering process as a whole generates an entity database. The attributes and the relationship that identify an entity are recorded for consumption, research, statistics, and other usage, or even to iterate the processes of identification and make make them increasingly effective. The relationship between the entity and each triple produced in the convention process and the source record that contributed to its creation is always maintained through the provenance plus the record ID. In order to maintain the relationship with the data that generated the prism over time and allowed to the entity to be managed both in automated update processes and in manual process using jcricket, for example. The entity, which we are representing as a prism, will be the result of a set of profiles from the many sources that are used. The final result of such articulated process is a complex entity, rich in information from many different sources. The set of these clusters, these prisms, fits to CKB, the cluster knowledge base that each tenant of the shared family uses as a cornerstone for the creation and the management of a complex ecosystem, entail based on our entities and no longer on mark record, which is still alive, of course, even for many operational library functions. This ecosystem is the result of the intense work carried out by the lively community of the shared family, composed of different strands of activities, which relate to each other and create a wider ecosystem with the CKB at the center, which is the heart of this new entity-based scenario. But the result of the automatic clustering of millions and millions of pieces of information cannot be 100% accurate. In a standard commercial process, we start from flat records to end up with entities representing the real world object. This step is not painless, and especially the final result of the clusterization process may not be perfect. To improve the quality of entity resolution and clusterization processes, the editor jcricket has been designed aims to be a transversal tool available to the entire shared community to collaboratively improve the result of an automatic processes. The role of jcricket is to monitor the quality of the shared VD data, identify action to correct the data, and steer the system in the right direction. The transition of the shared family from a mere conversion publication set of tools to an operational platform is happening through this tool. It's conceived as a collaborative environment with a different level of access and interaction with the data, enabling several actions on the cluster of entities saved in each shared tenant CKB, including creation, modification, merge of cluster of works of agent, and so on. In short, the summary of features of jcricket, starting from the authentication, authorization, auditing module to the user notification, with some detail on the main functions, that is edit, merge, split, in the next slides. 
I try to be clear, uh, um, describe you the flow. The edit cluster operation is available for jQuery editors to add, remove, and amend attributes, relationships, and general links belonging to a single entity. In a standard workflow, the user edits one property at a time, the recommended way to implement the edit features. However, the server, the server supports submitting changes for multiple properties at the same time as well, with some meditation for transit values broadcast. The application established a graph subscription to ShareVD to keep the page update on entities changes. If every action produces a mutation that is sent to the GraphQL server to let it broadcast the changes to other subscribers. If the user is a basic editor, only the properties coming from the user provenance will be editable. If the user is an advanced editor, the whole prism, meaning all properties, will be editable. When the entity um, changed due to some else modification, modifying it, the change is notified to our user browser as well, and the application update the related field. The merge cluster operation is available for users with the advanced editor role to come one or more source entities into one, picking the source clusters properties that must be port. Ported. The user picks two or more clusters to merge, then designate the destination one. After that, the user can choose which property to copy to the destination entity. The merge list is subdiv subdivided by entity type. It works just like a sort of shopping cart. After picking all the properties to put in the destination cluster, the user confirms the merge and contextually requests a review action by designating a reviewer. The reviewer may approve the merge. Invalidated cluster will remain in the system and their URIs are still valid, but they won't be indexed anymore. They will not appear in the search result. If visited, the, this, their pages show off in a grid out fashion. The reviewer uh, may even, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, reject uh, the merge, the proposed merge. The reviewer provides uh, some rejection notes to guide the editor to propose something new. The split cluster operation is available for users with advanced editor role to let them move one or more properties between two clusters. The user picks the giver and the receiver clusters. The user can then choose the giver's properties to be moved to the receiver. When satisfied with the choice, the user confirms the split and contextually requests a reviewer action by designating a reviewer. Also in this case, the reviewer may approve the split. The reviewer may even reject the split, providing some rejection note to guide the editor. In case the reviewer approves the split, the giver is, is now available to the world, deprived of the yield properties. The receiver is now available to the world, enriched of the given properties. We also have a feature plan to continue the jQuery and development with the feature that step by step the different user group add to this uh, uh, list. jQuery so is an example of how the shared family of initiatives is pursuing a new way of managing library cataloging in a cooperative way. JCricket purpose extended over time to also manage authority services for libraries by providing automatic and manual data quality control procedures. This means that JCricket pur purpose is now twofold. The creation and handling of linked data entities within the shared family and the di direct interaction within library system, both in MARC and uh, in RDF format. By this year, 
uh, we will certainly have a completing all the backend part while the front end will have a development part in the next year. The last part of this presentation will be focused on RD Pfizer, that is the commercial tool from Mark to RDF. RD Pfizer is in charge of converting data in RDF using ontologies such as BibFrame, MADS, RDA to produce NQAD files output. It is based on Hadoop MapReduce framework and the commercial process is based on Library of Congress commercial specification adapter for shared VD model. To better respond to some specific entity modeling needs collected through interviews with the user and users and expressed by the CEI working group, the ShareBD data model extends that of BibFrame, producing RDF files that may be slightly different from those produced in a standard BF conversion. But of course, a linked data project is never a closed project. Any linked data implementation plan cannot ignore partnership and collaborations. Imagining how each library can contribute to and benefit from them moving towards a linked data environment. An advantage of the collaboration with ShareVD is the extensive involvement with the wider library community to support interchange and the collaboration, in particular with Library of Congress, PCC, and LD4, with which many shared partners have actively engaged or on which they rely on various skills. These are some of the most fruitful collaborations within the Share family and its communities, each of which looks to the broader context of the collaboration, but following its own path of transition from record to entity management and the linking data applications. Share VD and the Share family are thus positioned in a wider community whose common denominator is the use of BibFrame as its main ontology. All of these communities work together to produce BibFrame data, but each following their own transition path, it is very likely that each end result will have its own flavor. Hence the need to define a sort of a common model, a minimum common and agreed form that guarantees interoperability in between different systems. But who can lead these different and various voices? The broader BibFrame community needs a sort of a conductor to find a way that can mainly assure the dialogue. dialogue. The Bib Frame Data Exchange meeting held virtually in September 2021 and represented different communities and groups, such as national libraries, Program for Cooperative Cataloging, PCC, LD4 Community, Vendor Community, and others. The purpose of the meeting was a discussed exchange of BibFrame data between system and implementation and how to ensure information sharing what has been done so far, what are the current plans and challenges encountered. What happened at the BibFrame Data Exchange meeting briefly? Discussed establishment of an international BibFrame standardization and exchange group. Scopus on focus on exchange of BibFrame 2.0 rather than ontology changes. So PCC taking the lead, coordinating with and including other groups, for example, the European and BibFrame community. Approved by PCC Policy Committee POCO on January 2022, the POCO subgroup appointed to develop the term reference, that is the TOR, and the TOR was finalized on April 2022. This is the origin and the work areas of the BibFrame interoperability group. And uh, these are some useful resources if you are interested to go in deep of this uh, uh, group. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Tiziana. Um, well, now I wish I'd listened more 
more carefully in my uh, cataloging courses in library school. <laughs> but I find it amazing all that can be done uh, from uh, the data of a record and how we, uh, we bring that, uh, we, 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 uh, we, there's value added in all the, uh, the processes it, it goes through. So I'm really, uh, I'm really impressed. <laughs> Thank you again, Tiziana. And now let's hear from our third speaker, Sally McCallum. Sally, it's all yours. Okay, let's see. If I can share my screen correctly. <clears throat> Okay, am I, is my audio on and am I, is my screen on? Everything's perfect. Okay, I have a message on my screen that says your internet connection is unstable. I hope there aren't any problems. <laughs> okay, uh, thank yeah. you. And uh, I, I and thank you for these two very interesting talks that we've heard because uh, mine is going to focus more on um, sort of some details uh, of where we are at the Library of Congress, rather than these broader uh, concepts that have been uh, uh, really nicely illustrated to us by the previous speakers. <coughs> so last year at the DCMI, I believe I, uh, the presentation I gave said that we were targeting for 2022 was to move our catalogers to Bibframe. Um, we uh, uh, are well into 2022. We might get some of them by the end of the year, but uh, it's more like a, a little bit, uh, it'll, it'll spill, certainly spill over into 2023. Uh, why do we want to do this? Because we are double keen. We have had pro pilot projects going for about five years now. And all of the catalogers, which are, uh, we've trained in, in uh, about 100 catalogers who've experimented with uh, 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 BibFrame, uh, they've had to key the records into the BibFrame system and then into the MARC system. Uh, but now we have an added advantage because just the fact, or the week before, uh, we selected a path uh, to a new ILS. And that's going to be Folio, in which we will be building uh, Bibframe, into which we will be building Bibframe over the next few years. And this would be a great advantage for the for that development if we could get our uh, achieve what we're trying to do, which is to put Bibframe into Voyager, rather Bibframe, use Bibframe with Voyager in the uh, uh, next six months. But our challenges are, uh, we have 300 catalogers, they're spread around the world. Uh, we have a large uh, uh, contingent of catalogers in uh, New Delhi, for instance, and we have catalogers in Cairo, and we have in Jakarta. And so we, uh, and we have catalogers and technicians that, that are in our, at, at the Library of Congress. And there are, even while there are a couple of hundred or more at, sitting at the Library of Congress, there are all these others that are around the world. We have many forms of material, books, maps, music, and we tried our best from the beginning of our BibFrame project to include all of these groups in the, uh, in the uh, pilots. Uh, that has been a challenge, uh, to be sure. We also have many languages and scripts that we catalog in, and we that has been another very serious or, or very um, challenging challenge. <laughs> we have, um, but the tasks that we have accomplished are we have moved the BibFrame system to the cloud, uh, which has made it, uh, and it has settled down there. And it is, uh, it, it, there's so much more st stability than we had before. We've integrated the parts of the BibFrame system. At one time, it was sort of uh, two chunks. There was the input system, and then there was the uh, uh, outside access and data uh, uh, system. We put those two together. There is one, uh, the input and the OPAC are now 
different sides of a single database. We've been refining the editor. We are in constant con a conversation with our catalogers uh, and our pilot catalogers uh, to adjust the bib frame editor to what they want. Now, this is, this is not easy. Uh, as the person who is uh, chiefly in charge of the editor would tell you, because different catalogers uh, want different things. On the other hand, sometimes catalogers adjust to each other, and so we have been we've been able to enhance the editor, and um, I think bring bring people closer together to doing to, to looking at things in the same way. We've also been enhancing some cataloger tools, uh, expanding our lookups so that we can have more normalization, as was pointed out in the first talk, and uh, we are uh, and our type of heads. So, what are we working on now besides achieving uh, all of our catalogers doing uh, into BibFrame? We're looking at, we're uh, working on a transliteration utility. We do, this has always been a controversial area, uh, how much time catalogers spend on transliteration. And when you have collections like ours that have so much uh, uh, non-Roman script uh, material that has to be cataloged, it, is, it becomes a big issue. We want it to be, we need it to be more agile, for transliteration, we needed to provide more cataloger assistance in transliteration. That is not easy to achieve. The, the uh, transliteration into uh, Cyrillic uh, of Cyrillic is very different from transliteration of uh, the uh, Southeast Asian languages, which is very different from the Chinese, uh, uh, Japanese, Korean languages, which is very different from the um, uh, Arab languages, and but we're we're do, we're trying to tune that to as far as we can, but they this raises questions and how much tr transliteration do we really need in our records? Uh, we're used to a fair amount because when we first started automating with Mark, uh, we um, had only the Latin alphabet. So we transliterated a lot in our records because we couldn't put the information into the records without it. Um, before uh, Mark, we had actually typeset the different scripts uh, with uh, uh, one floor at the Library of Congress had a number of, of large machines that could do Arabic and, and uh, Hebrew and all sorts of, of different languages, uh, different scripts, I'm sorry. Um, but we also have transliteration tables that the, they're sometimes called the ALA or sometimes called the ALA LC Library of Congress transliteration tables because we do we maintain them at the Library of Congress with the community. Um, but um, that they are they are different from other transliteration tables, and sometimes uh, data comes to us from our foreign offices or from uh, other places that is transliterated already, but it's not transliterated according to the uh, transliteration tables we use. So can some of this data be useful, even if it's an inexact transliteration? Uh, how well do we do even our own ALA transliteration? Because transliteration is, uh, I, I think, a skill rather than a, a, an automated process. So. We're, it's caused us to do a lot of questioning of how much transliteration we do actually need in our records. We're also working on application to assist catalogers in, in assigning else, uh, Library of Congress classification numbers. And that is um, uh, something that they have right now in, the, in their MARC system. And we need to be able to have that same facility in a uh, in the um, new system, in the bib frame system. And then there are the conversions. Uh, we have to do conversions between MARC and bib frame. Uh, why are they essential? Uh, the Library of Congress subsystems in Voyager, which we will continue to use, are MARC based. 
the Library of Congress commitment to sharing MARC records is, uh, is, is always something that we, uh, um, that we think about. We don't just think about it, that we're committed to. Um, that we, we must share our records with the community to help save uh, 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 the resources of the community since they can copy catalog. And we have many cooperative programs in which we have uh, groups of other libraries that are in contributing records or constructing records, and they are all mark-based. Uh, their ability to participate in the program will be mark-based, and so we have to keep take that into consideration. But in the middle is the are these conversions, and that has been a uh, uh, we started them. Uh, uh, five, eight years ago uh, with a mark to bib frame uh, that seemed like, oh, we'll just do mark to bib frame and, uh, and then we'll do bib frame to mark and that will be easy. It's not easy. And we, we have adjusted and adjusted and adjusted these uh, conversions over time, over and over again. Uh, <laughs> but now, because we have, a uh, well-developed bib frame to mark and mark to bib frame. Uh, if we we have to keep them both in sync. So if we change the if we see something that we can do better and we change the mark to bib frame, we have to adjust the bib frame to mark. It's become a very uh, complex operation. Um, the data that supports access in mark may be shaped differently than data that that supports access in the bib frame link data system. Yet that data shaped when we go bib frame to mark so that it so that it can be used in a mark system. Uh, and that is a, a part of the complexity. Also, mark has changed over the last 50 years. The cataloging rules have changed radically in the last 50 years. And rule change brings mark change and usually uh, duplication in MARC. Quite often, if the rules uh, are beginning to see a data element, they want to express the data element slightly differently, we end up having a new field in MARC or a new place in MARC to put that data, even though we already had a place for the same real actual content. Sorry. Uh, so one extreme example in trying to rationalize this data is series data in MARC. We've had, we had uh, initially a series fields 400, 410, 411, which were controlled name title series uh, uh, titles, series um, uh, uh, authorized, authorized forms. Um, they were made obsolete in 1999. There are still thousands of them within the Library of Congress system and in systems, other systems also. Uh, series 440 field, which was just controlled title, not a name title for a series. Uh, we still have many of those, even though that one was made obsolete, I believe in, uh, in Mark in uh, something like 2006 or something like that. We have the series 8XX fields, which are controlled name titles and titles. And uh, they uh, are used uh, with in relationship to the 490, because we have those two working together. We have the transcribed title of the series in the 490. And then we say in an indicator, well, uh, this transcribed title is not the authorized form of this title. It will be in the 880, 8XX field. And, uh, but if we say that it, it but if we don't have an 8XX field, then the 490 is more or less a control title. Uh, the transcribed title becomes a control title. Uh, but then there is this uh, desire, or there is this, um, uh, there's a well known guideline that if you, uh, have an 880, you theoretically have also a, uh, an authority for that series name title or title. Uh, LC Library of Congress made a decision in um, around 2008 to um, 
uh, use only the 9090, not to use 8xx fields. Uh, so, and what, and we, so that ends up with our cells, our, our bib frame project trying to say, what does control really mean? Is there really an authority record? We uh, do not believe there is uh, uh, consistently an authority record for uh, 8xx's in the, uh, in the file. And we think that there, there can be a new, a new, um, a new path to being able to give access to a series, to series in, in the format. Our desired outcome <clears throat> is to have 8xx's only, no more 490s, uh, authority records not required if you do an 8xx. In BibFrame, we make a hub for the 8xx. That is, uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it's not an authority record, but it serves some pur a purpose of normalization that an authority record does serve. Uh, we can treat the transcribed title as a variant, if different from the, the 8xx preferred title. But uh, that is, well, that was the preferred outcome. That is not so, so far. Uh, we have come, we are still, we have been able, successfully able to convert all of the 400s to, four, to 440s to 8xx. So we can clear the file of those uh, those obsolete uh, series fields. We keep the 490 in the 8xx distinctions when converting to bib frame, and we um, have to do all sorts of special things in order to be able to convert this back to mark with the with the distinctions between the 490 and the 8xx. And we are looking and hoping for a more rational path for this data. Working, however, working through any changes in the cataloging community is a necessary, with the cataloging community is necessary and it's a difficult process. So where are we? We've just released a new and improved, we think, uh, bib frame to mark and mark to bib frame conversion. It's called conversion 2.1. Uh, we don't. We no longer do one conversion and then the other. We have to do them uh, together. Um, for the catalogers, this means it's a very complex operation to implement this 2.1. For the catalogers, we have to update the editor software uh, and all of their uh, 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 the schema that they use. We have to um, uh, update the editor documentation. We have to have sessions with them to tell them if there are what the kinds of changes are. We always publish the specs for the community and that, and we have been working on that. We have conversion programs which, that we take these conversion programs that we uh, construct and use ourselves and we publish them for the community. And we have to update the bib frame, uh, the local bib frame space that we have BFLC uh, for anything we've had to do to get uh, to enable these conversions. And increasingly, those are, are things that um, we have to add to BibFrame, <coughs> our BibFrame vocabulary in order to accommodate going back to Mark, <coughs> pardon me, and, um, and we don't want to put those into BibFrame. Uh, we want to put those into something local, so we put them into Bib, BibFrame LC. So the new target date for the, uh, for, uh, trying to get all the catalogers to cease having to double key is uh, fiscal year 2023, which means any time from October of this year to through September of next year. And uh, thank you very much. That's where we are. And we look forward to working with the community to uh, as, as BibFrame continues. Thank you, Sally, for uh, sharing the current status of the frame developments at the Library of Congress. I'm always impressed by LC, and your presentation conveyed the leadership and dedication of uh, the Library of Congress to library innovation. So keep up the good work. 
Okay, so I invite you all to come back after the break at 5.15 UTC. Our next sessions will be either session nine, a panel on cross-domain interoperability framework, or session 10, a peer-reviewed uh, peer reviewed papers pertaining to metadata in domain applications. Enjoy your brain, your brain, your break, sorry. Enjoy your break and uh, thank you again and come back in 50 minutes or so. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, so thank you again. Bye. Bye-bye.